Hello folks, it is 10.30 a.m. on the West Coast, 1.30 p.m. on the East Coast. It's 6.30 UTC, I'll get it right in the uh, tweet at some stage, maybe not next week, but fingers crossed. And that means it's 6.30 a.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. If you're awake uh, and you're listening to us, hats off, good for you. You must have little kids. How are you, fellas? <laughs> I'm all right. Uh, I got to start off the pod uh, with a bit of an apology. I was listening to my rant and when I said however you pronounce his name, I apologize for how that came off. That didn't come off right to me when I heard it. So I apologize to the listeners out there. My wife's an immigrant. I've got an immigrant father-in-law that didn't speak English when he came to this country. I understand how that stuff can sound. And uh, I've lived with some of it uh, you know, through her. So I do apologize for that. Other than that, I've had a good week other than a shit sandwich from Robin Hood um, with the news. But, hey, everything else is great. Stocks are up. What's new? <laughs> yeah. I'm doing well, too. i uh, back home now, obviously. So that's, a bit of a, that's kind of bittersweet. But, um, yeah, feeling a little recharged, a little, little bit of a repose after a long 2020 for, I think, most of us, right? So... You had that nice Zoom background, the nice uh, Skype background, the blue content producer in the content house, the yeah. Sway House. Yeah, that's right. The, uh... That was better. You're right. It was also better to just go surfing right after the podcast as opposed to, I'm not sure what I'm going to do here. It's kind of gloomy outside. <laughs> yeah, welcome to California. What are we talking about today, fellas? I don't know. I was just thinking about how not that long ago I was naked in a pool. You're welcome for that, folks. <laughs> Like literally 10 minutes ago, but it's not heated. So that was cold. Mm. A little shrinkage. Uh, yeah, yeah. I've got, <laughs> it's true. I've got a little, uh, back of the envelope math on, uh, arcs, big ideas, 2020 slide, 2021 slide deck. Oh, good. That should be exciting. Yeah, we'll see. Is it possible for something that's really small to shrink? I'm of just course. asking for a friend. For um, a friend. Micros can I don't become know what peakers. I, here I come again. I'm not sure what I'm going to talk about. I've I've had a hectic week, so I apologize, guys. But we'll riff on something. What do you got, TC? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna do more of the uh, no no structure, no topic. Although I did I did see Tesla bought Bitcoin, and I I know that everybody's yeah. sick and tired of hearing me r uh, rant on Tesla, but uh, the the what it will do is it will complicate their accounts further because they won't be able to recognize any upside in Bitcoin, but they'll have to write down any downside in Bitcoin. So any reasonable security analyst is going to have to back that out of their accounts, which should make them further indecipherable. I just got a, a quick question for you guys. If you're the, the ostensible reason that they're doing it is because they're accepting payments in Bitcoin. If you're going to be hedging something like that, how would you go about hedging uh, incoming Bitcoin position. Well, just taking a step back, if you're going to accept Bitcoin, I'm not sure why you need a bunch of Bitcoin on your balance sheet, right? That's my question. Doesn't that? Is, yeah. That's the Texas hedge, right? Where you just get longer the thing that you're going to hedge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you just come out and say, like, we wanted to, we Speculate think Bitcoin's Bitcoin. going up, so we're going to buy Bitcoin, right? Yeah, that's how I saw it too. I can't believe that Bitcoin is a better use of funds than a takeover of fiat. <laughs> well, let's assume if let's you're just, that balance sheet, they, they're going after fiat just in a different, it is. different fiat. But this, this yeah. goes to the old like, well, why wouldn't GameStop just buy shares in Amazon, right? I I guess that the thing I don't understand is if I'm a Tesla investor and I like Bitcoin, just go buy Bitcoin. Yeah. Like, what the hell does Elon Musk buying Bitcoin have to do for me? And I think the answer really is that if he is the trendsetter on Bitcoin, then other companies will start to fl like flow funds to Bitcoin because he's deemed some visionary. And therefore, you get like this perpetual sort of cycle going, which if you're a Bitcoin bull, I understand getting excited about that. But I only understand getting excited about it if you're long Bitcoin. If you're long Tesla, I don't understand why you would want this or care about this move. I would say the best hedge, if you wanted to try to hedge this for the, for Tesla, would be Elon's Twitter account. And you just pump 
yeah. before any you pump before the end of a quarter you pump whenever you're <laughs> yeah. whenever there's going to be an accounting you start pumping yeah i mean you know i said i didn't have anything to say today but i really do and this is like <laughs> this this exact topic dovetails into what i've been thinking about for two days now like i just think that um it has probably always been true that visionary leaders get, you know, idolized in a way that other people don't. Right. But like what I see going on with, uh, you know, people that are VCs on Twitter that are like, I mean, if I was a VC and I was early on Robin Hood, I would take that off of my profile. That's how embarrassed I would be like, yeah, you're going to have the money. I get that. But like, you're proud of that right now. That's disgusting. Like they have such problems at the core of that business that I don't understand being proud of that. If you're Elon Musk, you're pumping whatever the heck that's called, Dogecoin or whatever. Like I get that it's funny. Yeah, like I get it's funny. I get that I guess that meme is like a mockery of the economy and whatnot. But you're talking about a guy who objectively had securities manipulation with a lie of a levered buyout and now is pumping cryptocurrency while he's buying it in his in his company where the fuck is the sec and and like what are our agencies doing like chamath is out there allegedly taking a company public via spac and not disclosing that they had a doj investigation like where in the hell are we as a society and i think the answer is late cycle so didn't, didn't i'm I... going to officially say <laughs> that we have moved past the third innings I don't know what inning we're in. How, how close are we? I will midnight? tell you. I don't know, but my boy that trades baseball cards is like literally forexing his baseball cards in six months and laughing as he's selling them to people. I'm getting inbound like texts that's saying I'm sending this to some sucker in Kansas. The the classic car market ripping, all these crazy cryptocurrencies ripping like. Anything speculative, anything with a story is ripping. The idea that this is fundamentals is insanity. I don't know where we're at. And I don't know, like, if all of this, like, let's say that people just take sane pills for a second. I don't know how that filters through the rest of the valuations. And I think that if reflexivity works one way, you can argue it works the other. I don't know what the hell to do with this information. It's why I think Drucker Miller says go 25, 25, 25, 25 on cash, bonds, gold, and stocks. But like, just, I think you don't he's know. confused. You just don't know. Yeah. Like, this is crazy. Well, nobody and wants like, to talk cash. I don't know where our government agencies are. Where are our government agencies? Well, they're pumping do it. something. They're pumping it. Anyway, that's my topic for the week, and I'm out. <laughs> How about a board of directors, too? What are they doing? What's Tesla's board of directors doing? I, look, I, I mean, there's a couple companies, uh, I think, that have bought Bitcoin. And, like, one was really early on it. But the guy's honest about it, right? The answer isn't, well, we might start to take payment in Bitcoin. Therefore, we went out and bought Bitcoin, right? Like, he just said, I think, I'm bullish on Bitcoin, so I'm buying it. At least the shareholders sort of... Uh, I mean, maybe Tesla shareholders know, right? Maybe, and maybe some people just are, you know, it's it's a Berkshire to them, right? It's a holding company run by a genius, and I could care less what he does. I mean, I guess I get that, but um, I just I don't understand as an investor why that would be something that you would like because you can just go buy it yourself. I think that the that that explanation is the right one, right? Well, I've got I've got a little comment up on the screen that said. Uh, if companies use Bitcoin for treasury cash, making payments in lieu of FX makes it a lower friction process than dealing with all the FX nonsense. Possible. You got to have international sales. <laughs> they, they have some. <laughs> Not much. Uh... I mean, maybe they will in the future. I guess. I mean, I guess if you want to say that they're using Bitcoin as an intercompany FX hedge, that's a cute argument i think you're forcing an explanation i don't think that's reality at all but what about the what about the fact that i think that's like one step too smart mm. what about this view that musk is this incredible industrialist that you know he's that tesla's this holding company of all of these different kind of business lines 
and uh, just buying some Bitcoin is kind of like Buffett going and buying a big pile of silver. Did he buy that in Berkshire or did he buy that in the PA? Uh, he bought that in Berkshire, I think. Exactly. Yeah, that was in Berkshire. I mean, look, the difference is one of those guys knows how to generate cash. Oh, no, that's not fair. <laughs> PayPal was a legit success. One and of, continues to be. One of those guys is uh, is the richest man in the world, and the other one is sort of just on the ladder there. You know what? Just because the Barely rest of the people on. think one is a uh, washed-up old man doesn't mean that it's true, though he is a little past his prime. Shout-out to the Buff Dog. Thanks for listening. Uh, I, I still uh, I still hold some B, okay. I picked up some in March 23 last year. Pretty happy with that. My biggest position right now. It's back. Yeah, I'd own more of it if I could. Downside is, uh, is close to zero there. Yeah. I, I mean, look, I guess, like, I do I do understand owning an entity and saying, like, I'm going to bet on this guy. I get that. Uh, so to the extent that that's what people are doing with Tesla, fine. I guess that I... Uh, I just think it's rich. That's because you're using forget, fundamental metrics. A... Yeah. <laughs> well, this is a it's a paramutual mutual game, right? And so even if you think that Buffett is in is inferior to Musk, what is the price implied? What are the odds that that Musk is that much better? And I would say that you're even if you think he's the heavy favorite doesn't mean it's always the right way to bet well he's younger right um so he's got more more runway i I guess it's kind of hard to look at the greatest industrial company that's been built over the smartest man's lifetime trade at 550 billion and look at tesla at 800 billion and think it's going to compound going forward but maybe it will own all of the economy and all of industry like who knows maybe that's real i have i have some answers for that all Actually, right. Ark has some answers That's, for that. that sounds like a good segue. I thought I thought you were going to yeah. say Bezos then. Bezos has got to be the man, hasn't he? Bezos is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's right. That's right. Sorry to my man, Shomi. And that's He uh, He took... Uh, is it homage? What is it? Offense? He said that you and I were... Yeah, um, well, bridge. he wasn't offended. He just was like, you guys way overly discounted Bezos in your conversation, which is fair. We were just talking to each other. I don't remember um, that. When did we say he... Do you mean in our in our? No, pod? no, that was Toby and I. Toby and I. I, oh, I love. Okay. I'm a, I'm a Bezos fan. Yeah, no, we didn't speak negatively about Bezos. We just didn't I like just him enough. That... Correct. Okay. Correct. I prefer Buffett, but I like Bezos too. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what i I don't know. I don't know who I prefer out of that. But what I do know is the difference between Musk and Buffett. And a lot of what I see today that offends me and like Buffett and Munger is Buffett and Munger have always talked down their stocks, right? They have tried to look out for the small guy and say, like, you can go back in history. They will say, like, we think our stock is a bit rich. They'll go back and they'll say, like, I wouldn't buy my stock at above, you know, you know, within this band, right? They've tried to keep their stock somewhat uh, connected to fundamentals, right? There has been some sort of like legitimate trust between them and their minority shareholders. And I think that what like I find so offensive and part of like what gets me so mad about Robin hood too, is it's like, you know, Buffett and Munger, if they were building Robin hood and they thought they had a better mousetrap, you think that they would not have customer service reps. <laughs> you think they would under invest in customer service or do you think that they would like, build out an organization and scale the cost structure first so that they could actually ramp into the growth and actually take care of their customers rather than like screwing over their customers and letting all of the externalities flow to society and then saying, oh, who could have foreseen? Like, no, you guys are pieces of shit and they are not. And that's the difference. So not screwing over their customers, though, their customers are Citadel and the, <laughs> their funds. Yeah, that's right? fair. Yeah, so, so that's fair. I mean, for those that don't know, I just found out this fact pattern from, from my cousin's case. He got an email that said, please bring $170,000 in cash to the table. He wrote back, I think there's been a mistake. No one answered. 
think about how much happened to people in GameStop last week. If you want to know why I was so concerned during last week, it's because they don't answer the phone. So, like, I can't respect these VCs that back them and are proud of the investment that they made. And the reason is I pray to Muffet, Buffett and Munger. Those guys have made me what I am, and they would be disgusted by that. And he was 20. Yeah. Which is a And baby. most of these consumers are young. Yeah. Like, I wish I could talk to Munger about that stuff. Oh, he would let it rip. Well, we got a chance coming up here at Daily Journal meeting. Nah, he won't do it in public. I mean, like, one, a dinner. Oh, uh, one-on-one. Okay. In private, just like, you know, off the record. But that's that's what I think that, um, like, the core of value investing to me, and maybe it's unfair, but, like, that's why those guys are my church. Like, I just, the way they go about it, and I know that some of the things that they do is, like, messed up, and I understand why people have problems with them, and I get that they benefit from bailouts and... You know, whatever. They're not perfect, but I have never seen anything that's made me think they don't treat their minority shareholders the right way. And I'd argue Markel is the same way. I think I think the guys, the ethos over there is very similar, and that's why I defend those guys. I saw a comment today, which I 100% agree with, about Tony Deaton saying that if you... Because Tony Deaton, I think, is another guy who's in that kind of class of guys like Buffett and Munger, and you know, there's a group of guys out there, Markel, I'd probably put in that group too. And they say, if you recognize what these guys are doing, and you recognize the way that they go about conducting their business. Like there is this little club in there who, and then they're looking for other people like that. Like that's the reason that I want to write the book, the Invincible Industrialist book is because I, I, I think I've worked at, not, not that there's any great secret to it, but I've just identified it and I just think it's an interesting kind of approach to, to the markets. I, you may not, you may not do as well as everybody else in this type of market but you're still going to be here in a decade two decades three decades five decades and that's what i'm trying to achieve and dude you're going to die with honor like that may not matter to people anymore but i mean i you know like i said i you know read the snowball if you want to read about his warts but like that dude is always going to have a special place for me i mean they helped me become a man these fucking promoters today disgust me. Yeah. I don't like I don't care about your bank account. A billion's not big enough. You're sick. You got problems. You got to like <laughs> post your own body on the internet. Like get out of here, dude, or do it on Instagram. That's not like it's insecure. That's nothing to be proud of. That's sick. Couple things. One, in fairness to Elon, I think in 2018 he did say that his stock price had gotten too far ahead of itself. Yeah, that's true. What, was it as long ago as that? that? It was more recent than that, wasn't I, it? I, I, thank you for that. Uh, that's a good comment. Um, number two, I, I do think you're right. Like, Even if you were purely cold, hard calculation, economic, um, like taking the high road is and having a good reputation is, is economically valuable. That's like, right. The deal flow that Buffett gets today is one of a kind because of that reputation, 50 years worth of doing the right thing and not screwing people over. Um, so even if you were just, uh, you know, very cynical and just economic calculus, it's the right thing to do. On top of that, you know, having a dying with honor, as Bill would say. Also, by the way, if you are going, to, and I don't know that these are true, I haven't done my own research, but this is what the short sellers are saying. If you're going to go out and say short sellers are un-American, you better not take a SPAC public that's under investigation by the DOJ and not disclose that. That's some messed up stuff. Yeah. I'm, and if the short sellers are wrong, I think they said it wasn't you should material. probably be able to sue them for libel. You know, there's some materiality thresholds with those kind of, you know, what you disclose. You don't have to disclose everything. You only have to disclose material things. I, I'm not... I don't know necessarily that they've done you the wrong thing. about that? I've seen some commentary from someone who was okay. a prosecutor who went through the short report and they were pretty uh, underwhelmed by the claims of the shorts in that, in that instance. Okay. So they thought it might have been a little bit kind of aggressive. To, you know, it might have yeah. been act of a short rather than like just, just – that's, that's me c conveying somebody else's – you know, views. So take it for no, what's worth. No, you're a smart dude. No, you're an attorney. I, I respect what you have to say there. See, this is good. This is why we all get along. <laughs> let's do let's do ARC ETFs. Okay, so um, you know, I've been working on after a decade of sucking my thumb. Apparently, I've been working on 
having more right tail uh, consciousness. Like, think about how things can go well, not just how things can go wrong, right? And, you know, trying to rebias a little bit maybe towards appreciation of the right tail, which I think is a healthy thing to do if you're a kind of a value guy who's predisposed towards the left tail like I am. Um, so I thought, well, who, these let's let's look who's really been killing it with the right tail kind of thinking and especially raising money uh, from a right tail kind of thinking. And that's like ARC has just been insane, the amount of money that they've hoovered up. I mean, it's I mean, they're challenging fidelities and black rocks and like huge, huge com like institutional money that is just unbelievable. And I think a lot of it is retail coming into ARC. Um, I don't know that for sure, but that's kind of my, my understanding. So if we, if we have, uh, sorry, let's go. Hello. <laughs> Bill's on a lag here. Um, <laughs> so I, I look at, they, they have a, a 2021 big ideas slide deck and you know, it's 112 slides all about disruptive innovations that are coming. And so I, I go through it and like, there's a ton of cool stuff in there, right? Like it's, AI chips and, you know, GPUs, augmented reality, electric vehicles, automation, ride hailing, drones, satellites, hypersonic flight, 3D printing, gene therapy, oncology. Like, it's all this stuff that's super cool. Isn't that the same? Right? Wasn't like, that like in the 1990s? Wasn't that stuff all in the future in the 1990s? <laughs> Sorry, be fair, it might be here now. Didn't mean to derail it you. Be here now. It is all cool stuff. Well, so so just real quick. She has been around since then, right? So she may have followed these trends and thinks now is the time that the inflection points there. I mean, that's that's fair. Could be, especially on a on a nonlinear trajectory, right? Like it, yeah. it looks like nothing at the beginning, and then it all of a sudden it's making huge strides. Anyway, so I'm I'm looking through this deck, and the first thing I notice is they say the word "could" 62 times in the deck. <laughs> Right. They're just talking about like, well, this could turn into this much. Right. Or and the other like th believe is in there 40 times. Right. So we're they believe that this could happen. That's right? compliance. So there's a lot of. Yeah, it's compliance, but it's also just how much of it is <laughs> hasn't come to pass. Yeah, right. Like it's it's there's a lot of uh, assumption there. That's fine, I guess, if you're doing these kind of projections. But I'm looking through, and like most of their timelines, they either put on a 2025 or 2030. And so I thought, well, just back of the envelope, I threw it all into a spreadsheet just to see, you know, all of all these cool technologies. What is the sort of TAMs that they're talking about here that they expect? And I added them all up, and they're and this is just from the ones that they cited in their spreadsheet, right? Like we're not talking about you know, um, anything outside of this, but their TAM for 2025 for all of their disruptive technologies, $3.2 trillion. TAM for 2030, $6.6 .6 trillion. And I'm like, okay, like, you know, we have a that's good growth. That's a, <laughs> that's a fair amount of growth off of probably much, much smaller bases. Uh, they didn't cite all of them where they started from. So I didn't back into like, what's the assumed kind of kager of 2030, but, but I did look to see, all right, 2020, what was the total revenue of the 18 largest tech companies, right? And it that ended up being $1.8 trillion, right? And this includes Apple, Samsung, um, Foxconn, Google, Microsoft, Highway, Dell, Intel, Facebook, Tencent, right? Like these are, these are name brand massive companies, right? Huge revenues. Um, all the growth rates that we would have never expected to to materialize 10 years ago. Uh, and that, you know, that's 1.85 trillion for all of those companies. So to get to even by 2025, basically like doubling that on in disruptive, right? Not just not just like, oh, well, Apple's going to double revenue in the next five years or 10 years. But this is the disruption, which I, to me means like coming from kind of out of nowhere. Um, OK, well. I think that it's illustrative to look at one of them in particular, and this is the ride hailing one, right? And like, I think it's like a super cool idea. Like it's stupid that, you know, most of our cars sit for 90% of the time. Uh, it's like, it's pretty wasteful environmentally. 
if you could have on demand on your phone, like in a deep enough network where you just walked out and grabbed a ride and it was like super cheap, especially because of autonomous, like you took the human element out of it. All right. Like I can get into that. That's pretty, that's cool. Um, however, they're projecting a one trillion per year profit pool for ride hailing in 2030. One trillion dollars. Okay. Profit, like, profit or like revenue profit? <laughs> Like net income. Wow, uh, that's a lot. And I'm looking, I like look back at Uber and Lyft's financials and I'm like, okay, nothing but red ink here. Uh, so something's going to have to really hit a serious inflection point to get out of this hole. Uh, and I'm looking too at like, okay, Apple, the last 15 years, they had arguably the greatest consumer product of all time, right? The iPhone. Oh, yeah. Just unequivocally like just an absolute uh lightning in a bottle that they caught right yeah. and cumulatively for the last 15 years apple's net income is just a little under 500 billion right so we're our, that's cumulative for 15 years of the best product the best company and we're at like half of what they're saying is going to be available every single year from this from ride hailing all right, like it's really limited thinking. There, like, well, stuff. it's it's software oh, marketing, man. Like back of the envelope, I I, I'm, I can't even get in the neighborhood. Look, I'm just being devil's advocate. They they're they're talking about software margins, right? So they're going to talk about some like tax. It's probably, but profit seems high. But what I mean, you could maybe argue that's like a forty percent profit margin. I don't know. What was the number? Was it a trillion? I'm I don't even believe it. A trillion dollar profit on, I think they said like six to seven trillion of revenue available, TAM for ride hailing. So is that every human being on the planet, seven billion people spending? Oh, I guess Oracle Brouhaha says, I think that profit pool includes a lot of things like telecom, semis, ride hailing, fleet maintenance, and OEM sales. I mean, I guess it's all a matter of definition. Well, it's going to have to there's going to have to be limited limited competition in all of those to get you to a trillion dollars of leftover non, you know, of producer surplus. What do we spend on cars globally? Like what's our transportation budget globally? I don't know the answer to that. It seems tr no, a trillion know. dollars seems high. We're going to start I don't spending even know more what a on transport is anymore. You're talking about numbers that just make my brain so oh, that sounds Fugazi. like a lot. <laughs> yeah, Fugazi indeed. Well, anyway, the, the the moral of the story here for me is like I want to get into this. I think it's cool stuff. I just like the numbers to me, like I can't get into the neighborhood still, even though I'm trying. Analog chips. <laughs> it's a good thing to look at. I think as an investor, this is a total left turn, but as an investor, I think the best way to get the right tail is just to not sell. Yeah, I think there's there's uh, fair. I think you you try and find so you try and find these things that are in, invincible, like great kind of like limited downside, almost no chance of having a donut, and they earn extra returns on equity, and they've got very fat margins that they can sustain. And then you buy them when they stub their toe, and you hold onto them, and you just in twenty years it takes twenty years before you get to that point, and then you get then having never touched them, that's how you get the big right tail. And it grows to some gigantic portion of your book, but that's that's the only chance that you have of getting it. You buy a few of these every year, and you just never sell them. Like I think I do think that's one thing that I can take away from the uh, the Motley Fool gentleman. Is it, which 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 gardener is it? David. David. I finally I found him on Twitter. He's got a very small Twitter following. He may, he may have only yeah, recently joined. Yeah, he's way it's too not, underappreciated. He's no blue check mark either, so I I wasn't sure whether it was him or not. But yeah, he's worth following. I think. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I I don't know the answers to these things. I, I don't think it's. I think you got to buy them small. Yeah, I don't think. I don't, well, I don't think you necessarily have to buy them small. I just don't think that it's really ever been people making these heroic projections ahead and then positioning themselves to capture them. I think it's been businesses that have been solidly delivering for extended periods of time. People just forget how good they are. Now they get their heads turned because there's a whole lot of shiny new stuff in the market. Or um, we go through some sort of drawdown and you get your opportunity to buy the good stuff 
and you just tuck that stuff away and you, you never touch it. And it gets to the point where it just keeps on growing and they do it. That, that's how you do it. That's how Buffett has done it. Yeah, I mean, so Gardner, like, he looks for stuff that he really likes when people say that an, a stock is too expensive. Like, that's what he's looking for. But then got he's... got all kinds at, of opportunities today. <laughs> <laughs> no, he does. I mean, he does. It's true. But then I think what I think what he does, and I would need to clarify this, but I don't think he'll add to a loser. I think he buys higher. Um, you know, and there is something to the winner's win. I mean... That that's real, um, but I don't know. Uh, Over what time frame? I mean, we're talking different time frames here. Like when you say winners win, this is like add something more to something that's been working for a few years. Not not like you bought it three months ago. You're down. Oh well, throw that one out. The one that's up, that's the winner. Like it's a little bit. There's a little I bit more. I bought Amazon to it than that, right? at twenty, but I'm adding to it at three thousand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet the answer to that is that they would watch the um, business results, and when the business results improve, that's when they would buy more, regardless of the. Sh- sh- I I almost don't even know that that company does much valuation work. Which is maybe unfair. They may they may do like ten years out. This is where we think margins are, and this is how we think it all falls out. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if that's what goes on, but I don't think that they do much valuation on today. Was he is he doing the same thing that that uh, that Jake is talking about here, where they just work out, you know, this thing could be a six trillion. There could be six trillion dollars in profit. We're going to stick, you know. A sensible. We're going to stick a sensible multiple on that. We're going to stick like a thirty multiple on it. Yeah, I think they do. Is that a, is that in quadrillions now? And then you just DCF that Everything. back. At least yeah, zero percent. I, I actually don't think that's that far off from that mentality. Um, and I guess that um, I, I guess that I would just say that like uh, both things can work. I just have a sense that one of those approaches right now has a lot fewer followers than the other. And I'm not sure that now is the time to be all galaxy brainy on the growth, but maybe like I was talking to my boy Francisco today and we were talking about, um, I had a chat with, uh, Andrew Walker inspired by your acquires podcast, uh, when he was talking about SPACs, right? And like SPAC mania. Um, and, you know, what, what Francisco had said to me is uh, much in the same way that I say, like, I don't want to turn my brain off to the overall market valuation or say the market's too high because I'm afraid, like, my brain will turn off. He was like, look, I don't want to just, like, throw all SPACs out as a mania because one of these is going to find a company that's, like, not quite ripe to come public, didn't make sense to go through the IPO process, but, like, could find a good asset. And I think that he's got a real point there. Um but, like, oh, man, on average, that's not going to work out very well right now. I'm an advocate. And that's how I think a lot of this growth th- stuff is going to work, too, right? Like, some of these are going to win. I don't know which ones. And I think right now everyone is looking in that exact same spot. So that seems to be the tougher place to play to me. If you believe in zigging and zagging, it seems like you're just sprinting with everybody else right now. Running with the bulls, if you will. <laughs> hey! Hey, singer. I'm I'm an advocate of uh, kind of ignoring the. Mo- I know that I know that I I talked about it last week. Like I th- I sort of think of it as being distinct from what I'm doing in some senses because I I've already got my the way that I'm shaped in the market. I've got my position long and short in the market. And I just kind of like the, Would that what be the bent over. That the- <laughs> yeah, that's that's the way it is at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> but I I think about. Okay. I think about the market as being like it's just some sort of curiosity that's there that I'm interested in kind of watching and I, like you know I, I it's every, everybody knows now that I think it's really expensive and, but you know equally you've got to be careful with that kind of analysis because you find yourself in a 2000 type scenario where unequivocally the market was you know that's as as, exp- as expensive as it's ever been 44 times on the cape but at the same time, you had this unusually good crop of unusually undervalued companies. And if you ignored the market and bought those undervalued companies, you had a few years just being long only where value went up while the rest of the market went down. 
I don't know if that's going to happen this time around because I don't think they're quite as high quality and they seem to be a little bit stretched. But I still think that you're better off, whatever's going on in the market, you're better off just kind of ignoring it and focusing on your own little, where do you think you have an edge? Is it an undervalued stuff? Uh, play there. Yeah. I don't know, man. I was going to come on here and say that I thought that Zig was going to outperform. I'm still a little, little early for making like a real table pounding call and moving all my assets into Zig, but <laughs> can't, can't mention uh, it on the pod. Can't mention it. What? I meant Zag. I meant zigging and zagging. I meant whatever. Uh, anyway, all I'm saying is I like the idea of being so something that we came up with is uh and we i mean was just like battered around on twitter today but like let's say the market is actually forecasting a really big economic expansion right uh nat stewart actually popped in and said like well you gotta think i mean you know this isn't genius but it's a smart thought too uh you gotta think about which stocks win in that environment and like um building this house that we're looking at building the cost of it is not like it's not cheap Right. And it's not easy to get the labor right now. And there is a huge pent up demand. So to the extent that housing is the economy, like there's a real argument for a boom to be made. But I think that the stocks that are going to really win out of that are probably like these more cyclical value plays um, as opposed to sort of what's rich today. And that's how I think like we talk about the jaws all the time. Well, home builds are cheap. Yeah. Home builds are cheap, steel's cheap. Uh, I think there's a lot of cyclicals that are cheap. Yeah, because I just, that's kind of, um, that's kind of a good, yeah. That's like, I don't know, that's the thought that I've been having. I'm sorry if I got you in trouble with compliance. I'm an idiot I'm not, I'm not, in, I'm not in trouble yet. <laughs> All right, well, then <laughs> we won't talk so, anymore. I'll be in trouble soon. The, the, no, no. <laughs> you're, you're, you're fine. The, the, I think that part of the... Part of the issue is that there's there's some sort of movement going on, right? Like, I don't think that everybody is going to be going back to the office. And I think that, you know, it makes sense. If, you're, if you run a business, HQ is expensive. It's expensive having lots of people coming in and working in your office. You've got to play, pay for that floor plate plus their equipment. It's much, much cheaper just to give them a computer and have them work from home. And it turns out everybody works much harder when you have them working from home because they don't get to switch off for the commute. They don't get to go out for drinks after work. They don't talk to their uh, compadres at work and waste time. They're just sort of like bolted onto their terminal and working when they're at home. So that means that there's going to be a lot more distributed work. And then if you don't have to live within commute of your office, you live anywhere that you want. So all of a sudden you want to be probably out in the burbs because the inner cities are looking a little bit scary at the moment. So what does that do to house prices? That makes people want to buy houses that are bigger and further away from, you know, the downtown office. And I think that's probably there's a little bit of that going on at the moment. I've seen housing has exploded everywhere. Housing's up as strong as it's ever been because people are like, well, if I'm going to be here 24 hours a day, I might as well live in a nice house. And I don't have to have it close yeah. to anything. So I buy some cheap land and put a, put a nice house on it. Yeah, I think that they could be right. Um, the other thing that I think is sort of an interesting dynamic that, uh, we may have talked about before on this pod, but um, I was talking to a buddy where I moved from, and he was interviewing with a firm that was going to move him to Atlanta. And he was like, well, you know, can I just stay in Chicago rather than moving because my family's here? And they said, like, you can do whatever you want, but we're paying you Atlanta prices. So it'd be kind of interesting to see whether or not that sort of like, okay, Facebook's well, you can done the same. live yeah, like you can live in a big city if you'd like, but you're getting the Country sort of uh, secondary or ter tertiary market pricing. That that would be interesting to watch. I think they'll just set a price for the job, won't they? It's not going to be where you live. I mean, I don't know that yeah. the consulting firms do that. You just get paid. Well, the consulting firms actually, they pay based on where you live. They do pay based on where you live. But I don't see why they would anymore. They just say, this is what the role pays. Yeah. You, you live wherever you want to live. I mean, I guess, yeah, I mean, I guess that's that could be where we're going. That would not be good for some of the blue states, well, we've, generally speaking. We've Although definitely already the seen it. I'm purple. There's a huge move from Los Angeles and California to, to Austin and 
uh, other secondary, not that it's a secondary market, but, you know, just cheaper markets. I think it's, I don't think that people in Austin have particularly loved it because it's pushed up the prices and there's a lot of, a lot of cars, there's some homelessness and so on, but it's, um, it's sad for LA. Like I just, I see everybody's moving away. I, I, I had, I lived in a building here when, when I first came in and there were like a dozen finance guys in that building and there are two of us left in Los Angeles. Everybody else has left. Mm. Yeah, that was my experience in Chicago. Now, you know, some of that's just that I became an old man and people raise kids elsewhere. But you look that's at the net migration, it. it's not great. Yeah. What? I don't know. I really don't know. All I know is there's some crazy stuff going out there. There's a lot of movement. There's a huge amount of movement. And it's, uh, I don't know whether it's COVID related or whether it sort of was just just about coming due because you know the tools are so much better right zoom is um fine skype is fine like you can just about do what you need to do well I'm, we're, we're like the last people doing a podcast on skype we might have to go to zoom next time and, and broadcast but it, you know why oh because that's the that's the because everybody's doing it it's the same way same I'm way i invest zoom i'll i'll strike before i go to zoom i got a bet <laughs> All right, we'll stay on yeah. Skype. We'll stay on Skype until you until you're. Dude, bed you'll wins. go on Zoom. You'll just see a big rat, like a blow up rat. I'll be on strike. When's your When's your bet When's your bet run out? Oh, it's like two years from now, man. Was oh, it as long as it that? Lo- That's smart. Yeah, it was a long term bet. Yeah, I don't think Zoom's any better than Skype, from what I've seen. I would I would be open to moving to like a legit like recording studio, but other than that, I think Skype and Zoom are pretty the same. You're gonna have to build one at your new house. No, no, I meant like one that like records locally because sometimes we do get chopped up right on the internet connection and uh, the replay could probably be cleaner if we were on a different platform. But All right, if well, some of the fans want to pay, <laughs> then we'll do it. <laughs> Till yeah. then, we're still trying to get this Tootsie Roll. Yeah. You know, one would think that with, you know, housing uncertainty, disruptive innovation up out the ass, uh, all of this uncertainty, you would expect that you would demand maybe a little bit less uh, Herculean yeah. <laughs> valuations with so much uncertainty. In Dude, the world. you got no alternative. Like, what are you gonna do? That's the thing. Like, if you have to, if you have to generate income with your money, what do you do? You're gonna put it in bonds. But you, junk we- bonds are now below four percent or whatever. Like the index I read. Um, you're not going to put it in corporates. You got nothing in the. You can't get it in treasuries. What do you buy? I, Ultra. I yes. Well, I have owned it, and I'm. Uh, you know, I feel a little sick, but uh, also, it's got good dividend yield, and the stimmy checks are coming. So people are probably going to end up buying cigarettes. <laughs> so oh, yeah. What happened in the pandemic? Did, didn't they? Didn't they punt it? Didn't they put it on the put it in the market? Robin Hood. Uh, some did, yes. That's true. It's kind of amazing. We better get to some questions. Is it? Is it? Are we running? Oh yeah. Sorry. Let's shoot, shoot your questions in. But I think it's kind of amazing the the run that the market has been on since the vaccine came in. It's and it's it's funny that it's hit. It's not really been a reopening trade. Like it's not like airlines have benefited from that. It's been yeah, but speculative I don't know, stuff. Dude. The, I, the enterprise value of airlines, I think, is higher than it was going into the pandemic. Mm-hmm. So I think they maybe have benefited. It's just kind of a lot of debt. Yeah, you got pushed to the back of the line if you were a equity holder before that. I probably should have bought back in them, but I don't really <laughs> want to live that life again. What about cruise ships? Do you think, because cru- I see the cruise ships, are, I mean, they're, they're equally beaten up. But they're not. Their their enterprise values like the same yeah. too. Well, that's right. The enterprise that's values a, the same. That's right. I mean, I do think it's funny. Like my, uh, you're gonna if people listen to my podcast tomorrow, I think we're gonna drop the Andrew Walker one. But uh, they're gonna hear me say the exact same thing. I got I got mad at this guy for suggesting to my mother that she should buy cruise ships at like in March. But it wasn't. First of all, the the bailouts and whatnot were still not baked. 
Second of all, my mom doesn't have the risk, like the money to go gamble. One of the things I'm most proud about that curate trade is I made my mom like 20 grand and that's actually changes her life a little bit. Like she does, she's not. So that's like her sort of financial situation. This guy's saying buy cruise lines in March. And I'm like, uh, you may need liquidity. You sell real estate. And like, I don't think that you should gamble uh, not knowing what's coming, right? So I mean, they all out of his... scratchers at the liquor store. <laughs> Probably. That's what I'm saying. Like, I maintain that guy gave her bad advice. Um, but uh, long story short, he, he the call was completely correct, and the cruise lines have definitely ripped. Um, but I'd argue he's right for the wrong reasons. And even if he was right for the right reasons, that's the wrong client. But I don't give financial advice. So I get a question. This is something I've been thinking about too. I don't, I... I don't really have a good answer, but I'm sort of interested because I do think that a little bit of inflation. So the two things that I've been watching, inflation has ticked up. The inflation expectations are over 2% highest in like the last five years. Um, and I think that that's, I, I have no idea how much the 10 year reflects the market and how much the 10 year is just the Fed with their foot on it, like just controlling where they want it to go. I, I honestly I have no, I just don't know. But the, the 10 years now popped up over 1%. It's at, it was like 1.16 last time I looked or something like that, which is still historically very, very low, but it really got crushed in March 2020. It was, I think it could have got down to like 60 bips or something like that, something crazy. So it's almost doubled from there. Do you guys have any view? Like what's the, any thoughts on inflation? Are we going to see some? Dude, we are seeing some. If you've like been to one the of the reasons, store, Jesus. Yeah, one of the reasons I like listening to quote the Raven is I I love when that guy rails about inflation because What's he it saying? really is true. What's he say? He's like you're you're looking at five to ten percent cost inflation on anything that you actually like and need, right? Whether it's healthcare or your housing, like your HOA fees. Like, I mean. It does feel like yes, I can buy a cheaper television, but anything that like other people want, right? If if you're spec if you're playing on anything that wealthy people buy, whether that's concert experiences or, I, I mean, I guess plane tickets seem to just get competed away. But like anything that can capture any of the value, the prices are going through the roof. Lumber, look at the price of lumber; it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Cars. Think about how much a car used to. I mean, I get hedonic adjustments and whatnot, but like you can't buy an entry level car for anything close to what you used to be able to buy an entry level car and have it be meaningful. And then, by the way, when you crash it, it's going straight to Copart. So now your insurance goes up because they're so expensive to fix. It's crazy. Here's a here's one take that I, I haven't heard a whole lot, but I think it might be kind of an interesting um I would say that there is possible that there's a kind of a dead band where we wouldn't see any inflation. And what I mean by that is if we got 4%, I would say it would take us right to 10% because the, hmm. the velocity would pick up so much with the expectation changes, the psychology changes. Like if we actually started to see it, it's going to come – harder than what you would expect just purely from because of the reflexivity of the psychology so uh i'm not sure anyone's ready for 10 percent and treasuries at five or six percent like do we have the do we have the will in any leadership position to actually raise rates again up to a six six percent eight ten percent to you know, I don't. I don't see Volcker around anywhere. In my, I mean, do we have the political will to actually close the wealth gap by pushing it like some of the pain to the rich, and uh, you know, maybe some of that flows down to the poor? No, we don't have that. That's been demonstrated for a while now. Hard pass. <laughs> yeah, Is you, it... mean, you mean a scenario where the economy does well and the stock market doesn't? No, we don't have that. That's not America anymore. Is there something sort of inevitable about it in the sense that Japan, which has the oldest, uh population got there first to sort of the zero bound with like no inflation that they measure that they can find like just can't find any inflation anywhere the economists and then europe was sort of europe is kind of comparably getting there and europe's now done the same thing like po negative interest rates no inflation as far as anybody can see and the u.s is sort of has had the youngest population of sort of the bigger bigger uh, areas bigger economic areas and now the U.S. has sort of 
getting there too. Is it just an inevitability that as your population ages, you get negative interest rates and no inflation? Somebody smarter than me. Value. What's Value Stock Geek think? I bet Value Stock Geek knows the thing to this. Also, shout out to Corey Hofstein. What's up, man? Um, and if if the boy Mike Nongaps on here, hey hey to you too. Everybody, hello, hello, all the fans. Hello, how are you? We love you. Um, all ten of you. Uh, Jesus. And time. Shit. What was I saying? Inflation. Uh, I lost it. In- something about inflation. Like. Uh, oh yeah 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 yeah. Uh, you know. I do think that there's there's um, potentially more political will for onboarding now. And, you know, if you, if you sort of onshore some of manufacturing and then housing sort of heats up in the way that we're talking about, I, I mean, I can see a credible case for inflation coming back. I, you know, I, I think that you need to keep letting like net immigration. I think we need to continue to let in for this scenario to play out. Like, I do think you need to have sort of your population growing over time and having young labor. Um, so there's that. I mean, Marcelo, this is Marcelo P. Lima's. Um, he, he talks about this a lot. Like, is tech just so deflationary that you can't have inflation again? And that maybe, but That's I think... Jeff I, Booth's argument, too. No, Marcelo invented it. Uh, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> yeah, invented it. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just crediting who I've seen made it. It's not my own thought. Here we go. VSG says there's a link between demographics and inflation. Demographics tend to drive velocity. Velocity's fallen off a cliff. What's that about? Yeah. Well, what now? Or this generally? is this is value guys talking macro. This is this is a yes. Yeah, we're we're way off our skis, aren't we? Next, next. Well, doesn't do, wouldn't wouldn't it be a logical thing if if the wealth gap increases? Right. There's only so much the rich can spend. So wouldn't it be sort of like a logical conclusion that as the rich sort of exceed the amount that they're willing to spend, that velocity in aggregate would slow? Whereas like if those dollars were going to people that actually like needed them and could actually use the dollars, velocity could actually speed up. And this is why I think um, ah, Real Vision did something with the guy. I don't know, but he, he was always deflationary and he just flipped to inflation because he's like, this is the first time that we're going to start putting checks and people's Lacey hunt what is Lacey hunt on the inflation train thinks so. what's Not he gonna 100%. do i thought it was was it van hoising what's he gonna no, do it wasn't it wasn't them i would have remembered i think it's a european guy um anyway um yeah i think that you know you put put money in people's hands that spend it and then you'll see velocity go up i just think the rich might have been russell of, napier now that yes, i think about it correct correct is he the is he the aussie is he horseman am i thinking of the is that Russell Napier? No, no, no. He's a sorry about Scottish it. economist. Okay. Just one of those Yo, accents. Somebody earlier said that I was like getting a little too heated. If you want to know why I get heated about Robin Hood, go to my Twitter feed right now. It's at Bill Brewster SCG, and you'll figure it out pretty quickly. I have a pretty vested interest in why I'm so heated about that particular name. I, Just saying. Didn't the, the, the first round stimmy checks, they didn't go into the market, you don't think? You know, via Robin Hood? Yeah, I think some of them did. That, I mean, that's what Barry Diller said uh, on CNBC today, and I think there's a reasonable argument to be made that it just went to gambling. Don't give it to don't give it to college kids. Give it to people who need to eat. But, dude, savings rates went through the roof, too. I mean, yeah. we really are sort of primed for a boom here. I know that that's kind of counterintuitive, but I, I do – like Morgan Housel wrote a really good article about that. I there's like really credible arguments to be made that the economy is going to do just fine in a couple of years or maybe next year. We just got to get over this whole virus thing first. Let, let Scott, Scotty Jackson. There we go. Google Scotty. demonetized us. He says, uh, Lacey, Lacey's long treasuries. Still, it's, oh, shocking. Hoisington's still right. long treasuries. They've been on that trade since 1985. So, yeah, I'm sure they're still long treasuries. It's worked well. Play to them. Yeah. yeah, it's that's the best. It's that's been the best trade. Even equity. You didn't need to do anything else. That's it. You just needed to be levered long treasuries and just let it ride. Let it ride. If if Robin Hood was built or bought by IAC, would I change my mind? No, I don't know if you know what I went through with that company. There is nothing that will make me change my mind. That's the answer. Yeah, is the boom priced in? That's a good question. Yeah, probably. I kind of think this boom and the next one are already priced in. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna. 
I, 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 we're going to need a bigger boom. Yeah, I think that's true. Like I, I, I looked at the, I, I changed, I slightly changed my methodology. So I've been running the, you know, my market <laughs> estimate. A bigger boom, that just hit me. <laughs> the, the, the estimate that I've been running, I've been running it back to the median uh, cape over the last like 170 years. And so I changed it to the mean cape, which is a little bit, so the median is about 15.8. Mean is currently about 16.7. So if you assume we go from here back to the mean over a decade, um, you're you're, st good. you're still negative. You're still negative on the index. That, but if you include the dividends, dividends will be the only thing. Dividends are going to be the difference between negative and positive performance in the index over the next decade. Plus, you know, it depends on how long it takes to get back to to the long run average. Maybe we never go back to. Maybe we stay at thirty five times forever. In which case, uh, you're going to earn like. Uh, three or four percent a year. Hey man, that trillion dollar profit pool, and I'm getting, uh, you know, trillion dollars in Uber dividends. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it. You're there. Well, I think to be fair, like there's not once you got that kind of uh, once you got the platform built out, like you got to update it a little yeah. bit. But there's not much to do. What's, yeah, once you get to six trillion dollar TAM, like that, once you're scaled to that, I don't know what you spend money on. It is super interesting these business models that have come up. Like again, my buddy Francisco was talking to me about uh, uh, Take Two, right? And like how they have, you know, and I should not just credit him because my boy Alex has been saying it too. But anyway. Like how how recurring the revenue stream has become within video games, and if you watch your kids play video games, like they got to buy everything now. The amount of like uh, personal beef that comes into my house when me and my my oldest, like he'll hit like inning two in his baseball game and he'll start crying because he can't play more innings, and then I got to go buy more innings. So I'm like, this is who sells a baseball game like this. Um, I don't know. It's kind of it's interesting to see how that industry is sort of evolving. I'm not sure I like it very much, but there's nothing I can do about that. I do like Oculus. And by the way, Apple, I think, is going to crush Facebook in that. Because I think that the big thing that with Oculus is like the resolution just isn't quite crisp enough. And I think that's like right in Apple's wheelhouse. It's early, though, right? It's early. Yeah. I remember that's seeing why I think they're waiting to drop it. The first VR that I saw was just garbage. You you couldn't like you turn your head and the thing was like it was like slowly man. Yeah, well that's that that was that that was the that was the idealized version that you saw on on the screen. Like not even the real thing was just awful. But it's pretty like it's kind of amazing how far it's got. And like the, if the resolution is going to get better over time, that's the that's the killer app, right? You're not going to need any other app if you can stick your glasses on. There you go. You don't need a laptop. You don't need a desktop. You don't need your phone anymore. You just need whatever powers those glasses. I think that's a problem with the Nintendo idea, right? Like Nintendo's always been a hardware software thing. And I just don't know that I think that they're going to pivot to like somebody else's platform. If they do, it could be sweet. Like it'd be wild to be your Super Mario and you're just running around your house jumping up like this and stuff. That'd be kind of fun. But how hard really is it? I mean, I, I say how hard is well, it? Well, it's to a do? willingness. It's a willingness. They'll get there. I don't Even if they're late, they'll the get there. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. There'll be lots of competing. Yeah. Like I mean, the story right of Nintendo has always been, though, that they run substandard or sub cutting edge technology, but it works really well and they have like engaging content. Yeah. Right. And it's well placed for the demographic that they're aiming for. That's fair. I can't give so. my kids the Oculus to have them play super hot and pretend to shoot like actual people. That's crazy. That game's crazy. crazy. Super hot. Yeah, dude, it starts to move when you move. That's how you start the game. So you start doing this, and then people, like, shoot bullets at you, and the bullets don't move until you move your head. So you can, like, watch them go by you. It's oh, like being cool. in the Matrix. It's crazy. Oh, really? Like, bullet time? What was that game? Max uh, something. Max Payne. Did you play that one? I did play Max Payne. I, that was it's pretty sick. sort of different. It's, it's really weird, um, but it's cool. All right, I got a good question. This might be the last one. Is it reasonable to focus on special situations, arbitrage opportunities in this kind of market, given where valuations are? Is it just a bit risky? So I would say it's the other way around. If you special situations are the thing that you probably want to be doing, this is what Buffett used to do when the market got really expensive. You do market neutral special situations that don't 
depend on what the market does. That doesn't matter about the multiple. You're going to get um, paid depending on what happens in the special situation, which is why I like the curate transaction that Bill and, and Michael Mitchell put on because you get your money back and then it doesn't matter what the stock does after that. It's a free hit. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think if you can find special sits right now, that would be a, a fertile fertile ground that I would enjoy, at least with a part of my portfolio. I think they're kind of under, they've, it's kind of in a capital cycle theory way as well, where like, I think a lot of money has left the, the ARB space because it's just been anemic. There just hasn't been the spreads and it's too efficient, not enough deal flow for that. So I think there is, there could be some interesting things going on there potentially of an, you know, it just might be a, a new heyday for that style. Yeah. And like, I think, you know, one reason I think you can follow SPACs is there's going to be busted SPACs. Like, you know that. So Pretty busted before it's even closed. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So like, you might be able to arb some of that. There might be like one that goes and, and busts. Like there's, there's things to pay attention to. I just don't know that there's things to do, if that makes sense. Yeah. Agreed. That's it, folks. That's time. Thanks so much. We'll see you next Alrighty. week. <laughs> Cheers, everybody.